Hey, hi all. It's me, Mike Watson. I'm here hosting a regular series just beginning now on the Frankfurt School and its relevance today. I'm here with uh, Martin Jay, Professor Martin Jay of the University of California, Berkeley. And it's kind of an unusual setup as I'm normally in the position of being a kind of unofficial adjunct professor on the acid left as we try and teach people uh, the audience uh, the value of aesthetic and critical theory uh, today in our very kind of challenging age that we live in. Uh, but here I'm with a professor with much more experience than I have. Martin Jay is um, a expert, an expert on the history of philosophical thought, particularly in relevance to the Frankfurt School. He's also covered a number of French critical theorists, including Sartre, uh, Merleau-Ponty, Foucault, Lacan, Althusser, and Guy Debord, as well as Jacques Derrida, in his book, Downcast Eyes, The Denigration of Vision in 20th Century French Thought, and has a recent book out, which we'll be speaking about today, called Splinters in Your Eye, which is a collection which covers everything from uh, Benjamin and stamp collecting to the reception of Marcuse's One Dimensional Man by the student movement, and perhaps uh, the way they misinterpreted it, um, as well as uh, the Frankfurt School and the way it's been appropriated um, with malintent by the alt-right in, in recent years. So the first question I'm actually going to ask, basically, is that the book is called The Splinters in Your Eye. It's out from Verso Books. It came out in 2020. It takes its title from Adorno's maxim, um, The Splinter in Your Eye is the Best Magnifying Glass, from his book of philosophical fragments called Minima Moralia. And um, so it comes from a section of very short aphorisms. The whole book is basically aphorisms, but this is like a section of very short, unconnected aphorisms. So I'm just wondering, given the kind of multiple interpretations of that aphorism, and the difficulty, indeed, of interpreting uh, such kind of small polemic bits of text. Anyhow, what do you see that phrase as meaning, given that you used it for the title of your book? Well, that's a terrific question. Uh, first, let me sort of step back a bit and talk about uh, the fact that it is an isolated aphorism in the way that you just described. Adorno thematized his style. Uh, in other words, he understood the relationship between form and content. Now, he wrote in many different styles, uh, but one of them that he liked a lot was this aphoristic style that he uses in minimum reality to great uh, effect. And here he was not alone in the critical theory tradition. Uh, for example, Walter Benjamin in Einbahnstrasse, One Way Street, or uh, Max Horkheimer in Demerung, uh, Dawn and Decline, uh, also Krakauer, Siegfried Krakauer, and some of the works he did that were collected as ornament uh, of the masses, also used this kind of aphoristic style, which goes back in German thought, at least to Lichtenberg, and has great masters uh, like Nietzsche. Now, the point of an aphorism, in a way, is to present the reader with uh, the congealed essence of a longer argument, something that is not developed, something is not discursively uh, defended. So it's not as if he's weighing alternatives. He simply hits you in the face with a, a statement that you either uh, almost intuitively get or are confused by or can interpret in different ways. And therefore, it's a spur, we might say, to further thinking rather than uh, the uh, end point uh, of an argument which can't be, uh, in a sense, continued. So this particular aphorism, this particular aphorism uh, is itself a kind of uh, transformation of the biblical injunction, uh, you know, concerning the mode in the eye, which uh, he uh, changes uh, to a splinter in the eye. Now, splinter, as I explained in the introduction of the book, is the translation splitter in German that was used uh, by uh, Adorno and actually is a, the normal translation in what we call moat. Uh, and then our English translation, I think it was um, Jeff Cutt, uh, who did the translation of Minimoralia, turned splitter into splinter. Uh, I like the metaphor because it captures something in the Dorna which has to do with pain, has to do with suffering, has to do with the necessity uh, of confronting one's own 
even corporeal unease before one can have a, a kind of a critical take on the world. But it's not something one does from uh, the perspective of uh, a kind of ideal, ivory tower, disinterested, external relationship to the suffering of other people. It's your own suffering, your own feeling of being uh, basically assaulted. Uh, and it's interesting, the assault happens in the eye. Uh, it's not by chance that the eye, which is normally seen, uh, and I wrote you know, this big book on uh, denigration of vision in French thought, downcast eyes, the eye is normally seen as the primary source of the information we get from the world through either observation or speculation. And the fact that our eyes are in a way damaged uh, and that we have to resort to the other senses perhaps to, to make sense of the world is I think part of this. Then the other part of the aphorism, which is sometimes less uh, appreciated, is that uh, a splinter in your eye, the pain that you feel, becomes a magnifying glass, which is a kind of crazy mixed metaphor. Obviously, a real splinter in your eye doesn't help you magnify anything. It just simply causes a kind of temporary blindness. But the magnifier creates the possibility of looking at details, looking at uh, the minutiae of the world, looking at the debris uh, of the society that's in ruins, looking in a way, as Benjamin argued, uh, at the lace on a dress, which gives you uh, some sort of insight into even metaphysical questions. But there is also a cost, uh, and the cost is that when you magnify something, you look at the detail but can't see the whole. One of the other aphorisms in men morality is that the whole is the untrue, that this whole, this totality, this global uh, reality, unlike the reality that Hegel thought was the true, is in fact filled with all types of deceptions, uh, all types uh, of ways in which we live in what uh, in German is called a, zusammen, uh, a verblending Zusammenhang, a kind of uh, system uh, of mystification. And therefore, it's only by looking at little details, looking at micro uh, details, that one can perhaps magnify them and get some purchase on, some insight into uh, what is behind uh, the illusory totality, uh, which connects with this idea of capitalist realism that you picked up from Mark Fisher, that we live in a world in which we are uh, faced with a, a kind of um, totalistic uh, opacity, which we can't see beyond or behind or under it. And so the idea of the magnifying glass of the detail is that maybe, just maybe, we can see cracks in that facade by looking at the details. And so uh, the splinters in your eye, the, the pain, looking at the detail, magnifying it, dwelling on it, avoiding some sort of overly generic holistic analysis may be the only option we have in the situation where there is so much uh, delusion, so much opacity, so much uh, resistance, we might say, to uh, a critical analysis of the uh, totality uh, that uh, still, in fact, uh, oppresses or at least uh, is still part of our uh, naturalized system uh, of uh, structures that we can't fully uh, either understand or so easily change. Okay, that makes things very much clearer. Thank you. Um, I'm just thinking, I mean, I always, I always kind of see, see, you know, Dorno's splinter in the eye as something which creates kind of cracks or fissures in the fake system and allows us to see more clearly the truth underlying the false reality of capitalism. But I get the impression that Adorno, you know, always sees these these glimpses of truth as never being really enough for us to affect any concrete change. But that is Adorno's kind of uh, characteristic negativity. But just kind of moving on, I, I, I just think that, you know, there's something about Adorno's writing which lends itself to memes. And I'm just wondering to what degree he, you know, even though he wouldn't have thought of the term meme because the term meme came about in the in the 70s. It came from Richard Dawkins. There would have been Latin equivalents, but but I don't think he was thinking of the term meme in any sense. You know, even so, I think there's something about his writing where you think, you know, was he kind of hijacking the already memetic capacity of the media industry in his time so that his work could not, should we say, go viral, but so that it would, you know, invert or, or or overcome capitalism by using its own tools against it, very much like Guy Debord in what he proposes with the 
um, with the um, the Reeve, but I'm thinking more the um, the tournament. Sorry, the process of the tournament. This process of of taking media tools, slogans, pamphlets uh, in the '60s, as as the situation just did, and 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 using them against uh, the the kind of capitalist media subjugates us. Well, you know, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, the relationship between uh, their practice and uh, the reality that they're trying to understand and also criticize. I mean, how, uh, in a way, mimetic is it? Uh, is there a kind of uh, uh, detournement of the uh, popular culture that they're trying to uh, uh, criticize, uh, a la de Boer? Uh, I think in, in many respects, no. Uh, Adorno is... I hate the word elitist because it immediately is a negative word, and you know we think of uh, somehow it being arrogant and being inherently conservative and so forth, uh, or vanguardist in a left-wing way. And the Dorno understood the necessity of difficulty, understood the necessity of making the reader or the listener uh, work. That you couldn't get a quick and easy answer if you read his work. Uh, it was difficult because the ideas uh, had to be expressed in a prose style that was commensurate with their difficulty, but you couldn't reduce them to formulae. Uh, and when in the case of such, uh, you know, aphorisms as the whole is the untrue, or uh, in psychoanalysis, nothing is true but the exaggerations, or, you know, others that have become Adorno memes, when he used those, it was not, I think, with the desire for them to go viral even though, in fact, that's happened. I mean, you can buy, uh, you know, coffee mugs with Adorno sayings on them, with T-shirts with Adorno sayings. So there is a kind of memification of Adorno, which has not been the case really with, um, you know, most of the other Frankfurt School people. I mean, they didn't lend themselves to that as much as he did. Uh, Benjamin to some extent, but uh, not the others. Now, what's interesting is the relation between Adorno's use of these kinds of condensed phrases and what I think, strictly speaking, is a meme in the internet world. Adorno's uh, phrases were idiosyncratic. They were meant to be uh, counterintuitive. They were um, meant to make you think. They were meant to be uh, basically provocations. A meme is essentially uh, a sterile repetition, an imitation, a kind of formulaic duplication of something which uh, deadens uh, your response. It creates a kind of automatic response. It's precisely what he attacked in the standardization of the culture industry, where you had uh, various kinds of uh, packaged, prefabricated phrases, and this was true of music as well as uh, you know, the written word, which then became substitutes for uh, critical thinking. So uh, even though it's possible to turn his own uh, stuff into a meme, the basic thrust of critical theory was uh, against precisely that, uh, you know, outcome. And therefore, the Frankfurt School becoming a meme, as I argue in this, uh, in this last essay, as it has indeed in the alt-right, uh, is a betrayal of everything that they stood for. And it's one of the great ironies of their history that uh, struggling as they did against uh, what I would call meme culture of en la lettre, uh, they ended up, at least in certain respects, becoming uh, simply standardized, packaged, prefabricated, uh, thought-deadening memes themselves. And, uh, you know, I don't know how to get beyond that. I mean, I, I express a certain despair in that essay about how to combat that because it's been so widespread. And I, I wrote the first version of that essay back in, I think, 2010 or 11. And it's uh, still, if you go online, you still see hundreds of uh, uh, versions of that, uh, YouTube versions in many languages, which repeat the same nonsense. So it's it's not been snuffed out um, by the most valiant efforts of those of us, and I'm only you know one of several who have tried to rebut it. Yeah, indeed, and, and this kind of nefarious co-optation of of the Frankfurt School or of left theory is something I talk about in the memeing of Mark Fisher, mm -hmm. um, which is out in September. Uh, and basically I look at how Mark Fisher himself has been co-opted through a process of meme making, often by the left actually, um, but it's not so much what, what they're trying to say through his memes, just the fact that memes are so linked to 
the kind of capitalist infrastructure of today that there is a kind of irony uh, in Mark Fisher who talked about this process of co-optation. He talked about it in relation to people like Kurt Cobain, uh, the Nirvana frontman in um, his Capitalist Realism book. Um, and he certainly took this idea of co-optation from, I think, the Frankfurt School, which is what I say there. Um, and it's kind of, yeah, I mean, it's... Um, it's kind of a bittersweet irony that he he's he's now being subjected to what he warned against in such a way that one can't interact really sensibly with his theory often um because it's made into this kind of very pithy um statements that can capture the imagination or attention not even perhaps the imagination uh over the internet so you know i i, I think this is a bad thing but i'm in two minds because I think also it demonstrates, as you say in that essay that you just spoke about, it demonstrates exactly what the Frankfurt School and, and Mark Fisher were talking about, i.e. that culture, particularly left culture and, and counterculture, um, are co-opted. Um, so, you know, if that's put across to people that this, this is happening exactly as these left-wing theoretical figures said it would and does, well, I mean... Okay. Like, let me just comment on that because there's so much in that. I mean, first of all, although capitalism does uh, package and sell and duplicate and, you know, it, it benefits from this, there are versions of the same process elsewhere. For example, when Mao had that little red book that everybody was holding up in the 1960s, all of those, you know, little basically aphorism, short essays, they were repeated ad nauseum by Maoists. So one could find the same process there. And, and I think those of us who were outside that recognized it as deeply problematic. You know, the people who simply waved that red book during the Cultural Revolution were doing something that was against critical thought. They were doing something against reflexivity. They were doing something against originality. And so it's available, we might say, for misuse, not only by capitalists, but lots of other contexts. And we have to be you know, vigilant against it wherever it appears. Now then, the idea of turning it in a more progressive direction, you know, uh, as say, using the weapons uh, of the enemy for your own purposes. This is a very difficult uh, issue because quite obviously that's done all the time. But, you know, we learn from our enemies uh, what works, what doesn't. But there's also a cost for that because you end up then replicating the bad effects uh, of the way it was used by, you know, the other side. And so there's always a danger in dumbing things down, in making slogans. I mean, even, you know, the history of Marxism to some extent has been the history of trying to figure out how to explain difficult ideas, the ideas, say, in, in Das Kapital, to the working class, the masses, the proletariat, the people who had to act. And there were all types of popularizations, all types of ABCs, all types of attempts to educate and so forth. And sometimes they were authentic and sometimes they worked well, but other times the, the cost was that the difficulty of the Marxist ideas were lost. And instead you got prefabricated, you know, packaged ideas, which were basically, uh, you know, sterile. They, they, they were ideas that had lost their vitality. So this is a problem that, you know, I, I don't have an answer to it, but it's a problem I think that uh, involves the translation, not merely from theory to practice, but also from, let's call it esoteric difficulty to uh, exoteric accessibility. Uh, because after all, not everybody's intellectual. Not everybody can read Das Kapital. Not everybody can read, uh, you know, Minimum Rally. These are uh, difficult books that require a certain level of education, a certain leisure, certain ability to reflect, maybe even native talent. Uh, and not everybody has that. So we have to figure out some way to, and I hate the word dumb it down, because that means that somehow you're making it just for the idiots, you know, Marxism, expliquer aux enfants kind of thing. Uh, but to make it accessible in a way that doesn't dilute it, that uh, honors both the thought and respects the individuals who are going to receive the thought. And that's a real challenge. Um, and a lot of people, you know, do a, a good job, I think, meeting the challenge. I mean, I just look, for example, at a, uh, a, a graphic novel, a kind of big, um, uh, you know, cartoon book uh, on Marcuse's life that was published uh, fairly recently by City Light Books. I'm blanking the name of the author. And it does a nice job of, of translating Marcuse's life and ideas into uh, a much more accessible form. So I think, you know, it's it's a real challenge to do it without dumbing it down, without being condescending, without, you know, being basically, 
uh, a betrayer of the ideas in their more difficult form. Yeah, and this is something I find very difficult because, I mean, the history of, of, of modern art is very much one of making art accessible to the, to, to the masses. It's not, it's not what everyone's been doing, that, that, you know, and it's not what all of the kind of stakeholders in, in modern art and contemporary art have been doing, but there's a lot of talk around an art for everyone. And actually, if you look at what's happening in the museums and, and art galleries, um, this has never really manifested. Art doesn't really feel like it's for everyone. It still feels very distant for many people, not just the things that are being made, which can be very hard for many people to really understand because they're abstract or because they're conceptual or something, but also the, the spaces themselves, the, the codes of behavior in the art world can feel intimidating to, to, to many people. Um, I mean, I don't always feel comfortable in the art world, and I've written for a number of the largest art magazines over a period of a decade and curated at, at major art festivals and, and museums. Um, so I can very, very much relate to, you know, to, to how people can feel excluded from the art world. But also, um, you know, you have to consider that, that, that the Internet, you know, it, it, it does do that thing that the art world can't do, that, that it is a space for anybody to express themselves and to get an audience. So you have this kind of realisation of the avant-garde dream of an art for all, but then it's not doing what we want it to do. And also you can talk about a philosophy for all or a science for all, you know, just whatever. The Internet is this grand repository of information, which which was a, a dream in the 1990s when I first started using it as a student. And we all had this kind of feeling that, you know, because it's kind of democratic, it's going to lead to more democracy. But then we're seeing something very different happen um, and kind of really weird uh, far right views and far left views emerging from memes and um i mean not just weird but you know obviously deeply troubling um so you know this is tricky and i i kind of want to believe that there's still something good in all this but also that some of this somehow fits in with some of the frankfurt school thought and, and i'm i, I kind of think well with adorno that's only really if you consider the internet to be an abstraction so adorno favored abstraction as i said earlier because it can kind of like disrupt the, the false truth of capitalism um so maybe the internet if you kind of throw it all together as a whole is an abstraction which can disorient us to some degree and lead us to rethink but i'm not seeing that really happen um in my daily life i think maybe benjamin's more appropriate in his use of um constellations and the uh, phantasmagoria so basically benjamin kind of saw um, the possibility that you can kind of take different capitalist objects and draw constellations and from them piece together the history of capitalism and, and then maybe rethink it. Or I think that's what he's, he's saying. Um, I don't know. I mean, is there anything you can see in the Frankfurt School that maybe chimes with what's happening online today that, that could be positive? Well, I, you know, there are many uh, points of connection between uh, the Frankfurt School tradition understood as something that developed over maybe now it's a full century uh, and events today. Um, and there have been many recent um, resurrections, for example, the work they did on the authoritarian personality or the work they did on techniques of uh, the uh, demagogue, Prophets of Deceit by Leo Lowenthal, for example. So there is a, a lot of relevance in that score. Uh, then also uh, this analysis uh, of uh, the um, racket society, which I briefly tried to talk about in my little essay on Scorsese's uh, film, uh, The Irishman. Uh, but there are others as well. I mean, one of them is the issue of the relationship that you've just pointed to between the aesthetic realm or art uh, or the practices of artists or uh, the practices of uh, all of us that are in some ways aesthetic, not simply those who are designated uh, as specialists in art. The relationship between that and some sort of placeholder, we might say, for an alternative society. So that art, for all of its uh, complicity, for all of its functioning in the service of maintaining uh, the status quo, being what they would call affirmative, art in certain respects and understood uh, maybe with a little bit of help from theory, is one of the repositories of the other, of the non-identical, of the future hope, of whatever you want to call the um, 
human desire for uh, an alternative uh, reality from the one that we now um, inhabit. So to that extent, they've been among those um, leftist theorists who have taken seriously the aesthetic, I and mean, this is true of many Western Marxists, and have tried to make sense of it as it developed, not simply as an abstraction, even though Adorno did write a book called Aesthetic Theory, which seems to suggest we can talk about art with a capital A, but as it developed uh, in both popular mass and uh, elite or esoteric forms and the relationship that sometimes uh, breaks down the difference between them. So one has to then ask concrete questions, which art, um, which practice, not simply art uh, with a capital A. And uh, Adorno himself in his own, let's say, theorizing about music, understood uh, the uh, we might say uh, changes, uh, even in the modern music that he championed during his youth, the music of the Schoenberg School, and how it had been, uh, in a sense, undermined by, say, Schoenberg's turn to the 12-tone row and you know, some of the ways in which it was used in the 1950s and 60s, and he tried to push towards something different. And, you know, here we are 60, 70 years later, we're confronted with a new musical landscape, we might say, and we have to think about uh, it in ways that uh, go beyond the way he thought about it. So it's an ongoing uh, project. And I think one of the great things about critical theory is that rather than a uh, canonical series of texts, which we simply go back to and look for uh, wisdom, it's a constant spur to think differently and to think uh, in terms of your own situation rather than simply recycle stuff from the past. So uh, to that extent, it's uh, eclectic, it's uh, porous in its boundaries, it's non-worshipful um, of the ancient uh, wisdom of the founders. Um, it's had several different generations and it's had now global reach and, uh, you know, we're learning constantly from people who have adopted it uh, and adapted it in different parts of the world. So that's a pretty big answer to, uh, you know, a precise question, but I think that's part of why it still has a certain charm and, and function today. So, yeah, I mean, I certainly agree. I think we need to be thinking uh, more about Frankfurt School methods rather than what they said and trying to apply what they said to today uh, in a very different and very unique times i think in that regard benjamin is very useful and actually some of what he said is spot on in regard to our times as well it happens it so happens um i'm just thinking really again of his constellations i didn't possibly explain very well for the viewer the first time uh, i think you probably would have gathered what i was getting at but just to kind of revisit that benjamin spent time walking around the arcades of paris he's kind of covered uh you know, kind of in, in indoor markets uh, that 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 were built as 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 alleyways undercover, in which people could go shopping uh, in the in the nineteenth century. As Benjamin walked around these alleys, kind of enacting the behaviour of a flaneur from the nineteenth uh, century, the century prior to to when he lived, um, he he tried to bring together objects against the background of the architecture, which is very much a product of industrial capitalism, and to put these into groups, into constellations, and thereby draw um, a kind of map uh, of, of where capitalism had arrived today as he was looking at it, and through that, the history of capitalism and how we arrive where we are today to better understand it and to better challenge it. And I'm just thinking that maybe today's internet can be thought of in a similar way that we can crawl the internet and try and make constellations out of the image objects, the memes, the YouTube videos, the news stories, the social media feeds, and thereby better understand previous incarnations of capitalism. That would be perhaps even the period that Benjamin lived in and he was as he, as he was looking back. To, to prior periods, um, but also I'm just thinking about um, his work of art in the, in the age of mechanical reproduction, the essay of, of, of the 1930s, in which he said that basically people suddenly, with all of the image objects they could see as magazines, as prints, um, as biscuit tins with paintings on, what have you, uh, this is basically what he was getting at, that people suddenly wanted more riches, more stuff, and that the fascists of the era diverted 
um, people from this desire through fascist parades, through um, encouraging hatred of foreigners and a thirst for warfare, etc. So um, if you think about that, what we have today is, you know, a, a, a huge repository of images which are constant and bombarding us, you know, much more than in Benjamin's era. So if he said that was the case then, it's possibly much more the case. I think we can definitely see that through Instagram, through Twitch, etc., people have this kind of thirst for fame and for riches, which actually is kind of tangible um, because one can become famous or rich almost accidentally through through social media. But most of us don't. So there's this kind of unrequited, um, you know, desire for stuff and for power. And Trump and, and Johnson res have responded to that uh, by saying, look, um, you know, you can build a wall. You can bring us out of the EU in Britain. And 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 then people feel, therefore, that they're, they're getting to express their choices freely, politically, much as they do online every day. And um, you know, I, I I I think there's a lot in that. So I think there's a lot we can take from the Frankfurt School, even if the, it doesn't completely coincide. And and I think we should be thinking maybe about the constellation and about how we can amass uh, histories through the internet and better understand uh, how to move forward. But I, I also just want to reflect on your essay, um, which I think you've maybe referenced um, here, um, Trump Scorsese and the Frankfurt School's Theory of Racket Society from 2020, in which you basically say that today's politics proceeds much as a racket, as in uh, the 1940s, when Horkheimer first used this term, the racket society, to describe a kind of criminal um, form of politics, um, w w which is highly irrational. And I just, I'm just thinking that is almost exactly the opposite to Adorno's administered society, which means a kind of bureaucracy which comes out of rationalized society and enlightenment period values, which, which kind of goes awry. So the rationality of the enlightenment, which is supposed to free us from kind of mythic thinking and religious thinking ends up subjugating us under too many rules and directives. All right, well, look, for, first to step back a bit, the idea of consolation is very, I think, suggestive. Uh, just to put in a plug for a book by a good friend, Susan Buck Morse's most recent book is called The Year One. And she actually is bold enough to do a consolation between the present and uh, the uh, beginning, really, of the Christian era uh, in terms of both philosophy and even religious thought and tries to find ways in which we can illuminate the present by going that far back. So it's a very suggestive technique, a uh, technique of juxtaposing things that seem not to fit together. And, uh, you know, you create, if Benjamin is right, profane illuminations. And in a way, the Racket Society analysis uh, is also an example of that. Horkheimer was very keen on it in the 1940s. It never, however, got fully developed. There were hints in various essays. There were residues of a project that was unfulfilled in some of the things they published. But by and large, it never really got off the ground. And the analysis that was closer to state capitalism, the administered world, was the one that really triumphed in their analysis. Uh, so what was the Racket Society uh, model? Well, basically, it was one based on the notion that in pre-bourgeois times, the ways in which society was organized, and here they're really talking about the West and maybe some aspects of other societies, was through the loyalty uh, and protection uh, of a warlord or uh, a figure who had some sort of coercive power, uh, which he, and it was always a he, granted to his underlings uh, in return for uh, you know, some sort of tribute. So that it was a personal relationship, a relationship of fealty uh, and uh, reciprocity, which demanded loyalty, but also involved, let's say, the, the um, uh, division of spoils, which involved a kind of uh, non-regularized, non-abstractly uh, legal, non-theoretically uh, uniform relationship, but one that was, uh, you know, very much ad hoc. Now, this was, to a certain extent, supplanted both by capitalism as a system regulating the economy through the marketplace and through various ways in which the state regulated the marketplace. Uh, you know, think of lots of ways in which that occurred through taxation and currency and so forth. And also the rule of law. So the rule of law, which involves a kind of formal 
equality uh, overcomes the individual loyalty, uh, the individual uh, sense of, well, you help me, I'll help you, uh, uh, kind of personal relationship that existed uh, prior to uh, the full uh, extent of bourgeois rule of law. Now, their argument was that under fascism, bourgeois and even capitalist uh, norms of abstraction and formal equality were being underlined, and that we were returning to a kind of uh, pre-bourgeois society in which this kind of uh, protection racket was becoming the norm. Now, they ultimately decided this was not really adequate as a way to explain uh, the world they were living in. Even though fascism showed signs of it, when it was defeated or when you know, it was almost defeated in the mid-40s, they thought, no, no, we have to go back to an understanding that uh, stressed uh, bureaucracy, stressed uh, you know, the various let's say, uh, both positive and negative aspects of formal law. Now, what became, uh, became apparent to me during uh, the Trump administration was that their analysis, and I was not the only one who saw this, their analysis of rackets was making sense of a growing, but not yet uh, dominant aspect of our own lives, that uh, loyalty, personal loyalty, and a kind of a division of spoils uh, and a kind of being above the law or outside the law was uh, in a way that we had not really expected returning with Trump. And as you said, maybe there are aspects of it in Johnson, maybe other, uh, you know, we can maybe Bolsonaro, there are other figures around the world who represent the same phenomenon. And this uh, model, the racket society model, gave us some sort of insight into an alternative to the administered world uh, analysis in which bureaucratic instrumental rationality and control from above uh, was, uh, you know, somehow adequate to what was going on. Now, my general feeling is that it's not either or, that we see aspects of both. Uh, and the struggle is not yet ended. I mean, Trump was defeated, but we see in the way in which the Republican Party in the United States has been utterly and completely taken over by people who owe their existence really to loyalty to Trump and how he rewards his uh, loyal followers and how he destroys people who speak against him. And this is an extraordinary uh, departure from the way in which normal politics and at least the American experience uh, has taken place and a return to a kind of racket society quality. The fact that you know half of the people around him are uh, under indictment, in jail, uh, you know, obviously corrupt, uh, people who are out for themselves, people who make fortunes, you know, this, this guy who was just uh, indicted for, uh, you know, being a foreign agent for the, uh, the Emirates uh, and was the head of his inauguration committee. I mean, it's now a daily drumbeat, we might say, of corrupt racket like gangster uh, figures who are prominent in his uh, world. So it captures something that we thought had gone away, but the Franklin School sort of understood, had returned with fascism and had the potential to return as it now has uh, in a post neoliberal world. I mean, that's the thing to think about, uh, I think most, that neoliberalism seemed to be the dominant paradigm for a long time. We're moving beyond it with populism and with this kind of racket model uh, in which some of the mechanisms of neoliberalism have been exposed and a right-wing as well as left-wing alternative has emerged. Uh, and uh, the right-wing alternative emerged, for example, in the uh, Brexit uh, uh, debate. So uh, we're in a very turbulent moment, and I think the racket uh, analysis gives us some insight. It doesn't explain everything, but, and you know, we wouldn't uh, assume that it does, but it, it gives us some purchase on what's going on. Yeah, this certainly chimes with with, with my concerns. Uh, being British, although I've lived outside Britain now for over twelve years, in Italy first for ten years, and now in in Finland, but I still look very much to Britain and what's happening. And I think that Boris Johnson very much fits uh, this kind of leader of a, of a of a racket society, as you describe it, coming down from Horkheimer and the Frankfurt School. Um, I, I, I have a couple of other thoughts. So one is that, I mean, is is Johnson so different from his predecessor? Certainly, his predecessor is immediately in the Tory Party, but you know, also going back decades on either side, is Biden so different from his predecessors? Um, 
I'm not so sure. I think definitely Trump and Johnson have marked a kind of break with normality, but perhaps it's a break that happens when people are under a kind of extreme pressure in that, I mean, if you look to Adorn on Horkheimer's Elements of Antisemitism, the closing essay from Dialectic of Enlightenment, they talk about this fear um, leading, you know, fear when people are under perhaps economic pressure, uh, when they don't know what their lives are about, when they feel a loss of narrative leading to people projecting that fear outwards onto the other. And this you know, can become racism or other kinds of other, other forms of, of, of bigotry. Um, and it basically functions because we have a fundamental fear of, of nature and more particularly of our own mortality. So, you know, when we're kind of in a position of feeling vulnerable and feeling our mortality, we put Project this kind of the, the, the dirtiness, um, the objectivity, the or you know the being object of of death onto other people, there thereby making them objects or you know coming up with these stereotypes of the you know the, un, the unclean foreigner, for example. So um, I wonder whether that happens when there are economic depressions and other pressures, and that. It's easier then to have somebody like Trump or Johnson enter the fray. And it's not so much a break with normality, but capitalism as normal going through a kind of uh, different format um, as, as as archetypes, we say, uh, racial archetypes um, are evoked in, in, in people's minds. I think there's no question that um, the racket society analysis is based on the idea of uh, precarity uh, and fear. But in other words, if you are vulnerable, if you don't have uh, answers to your uh, you know, dilemmas, you often see uh, a strong man or a protector who will somehow say, it's okay, in return for your loyalty to me, I will uh, you know, give you something. I'll give you uh, the physical protection, uh, you know, the way a warlord would uh, give you uh, some sort of material reward so that fear and anxiety and the sense of being uh, vulnerable and being, you know, living a life of precarity or a life of vulnerability is, I think, part of that dynamic. Uh, and it's obviously the case that insecurity can be psychological as well as material. Uh, and insecurity can take many different forms. Um, I mean, I think, you know, we have to be I mean, this is a, you know, a great, almost existential question. I mean, humans, by definition, are insecure. Uh, I mean, we live lives that are vulnerable to all types of, uh, you know, basic assaults uh, from the natural world, and we're mortal, and we know it, and so forth. So that uh, fear or anxiety or uh, a justifiable sense of dread, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, have recognized this as the human condition. Now, the question is really whether or not uh, it's exacerbated, whether or not it's alleviated, whether or not it's realistic, whether or not it's, uh, you know, somehow something that people can cha channel and turn to different uh, nefarious uh, results or, uh, you know, give some sort of honest response to. And I think what we're faced with is the difficulty of coming um, up with a uh, secure solution. So I, I recently did a in response to some sort of, uh, you know, big questionnaire about where we are, I suggest that what we need to do is stress security, that, you know, the idea not of national security, which was a right wing idea, basically, of military, uh, you know, supremacy, but rather the notion of social security, that we need to have security against uh, uh, pandemics, we need to have security against uh, the supply chains that uh, feed us every day from being disrupted. We need security against uh, unemployment, we need security against uh, what, uh, you know, bullying. I mean, lots of things that create insecurity. So this is a major, I would say, challenge for the left. How do we somehow figure out a way to win the battle uh, over security? Because the right wing feels insecure, and the people who support the right wing, insecure because of immigration, insecure because of uh, job loss, insecure because their culture is under what they see is threat and so forth. So insecurity and security is a major battleground, we might say. And I think uh, we have to recognize that there are no absolute answers. We can't make 
life secure because we are by definition going to die and by definition we're going to fall ill and loved ones will die and so forth that it's not uh, as if we can become fully and completely secure uh, in any realistic way but we can mitigate the most egregious examples of insecurity produced by human foolishness or greed uh, or just evil and create ways to at least let's say spread the risk so the ways in which we can somehow maximize the security of everybody rather than only giving it to the privileged few and increasing the precarity of the many uh, is a task that I think the left has to face uh, in a realistic way. And it can't be faced, and this seems to me a lesson in general, by saying until we end capitalism, it's going to be part of the human condition. Because the ending of capitalism, you know, it may happen, uh, but not certainly in my lifetime. But what will replace it is not so clear. And in the interim, there are an awful lot of people who will live and die. And we have to, I think, uh, alleviate their misery rather than see them as instrumental in the service of some sort of apocalyptic scenario of the end of capitalism producing some utopia. Uh, so that's a, going off a bit on a tangent, but I think it's part of the larger task that the left has to face in a realistic way you know i think that that, that um we we need to maybe um we, we need to maybe climb down off our war horses a bit um on the left and right at the moment and 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 i think you know looking at adorno and benjamin and the other thinkers of the frankfurt school can be can be very useful in this uh that kind of brings me on to Another question I have, and that is where in your book, Splinters in Your Eye, you talk about this demonization of the Frankfurt School by the alt-right and a kind of meme emerging of uh, the Frankfurt School that's completely out of touch with reality. And uh, can you just elaborate on that? Because you were kind of personally involved somehow right. uh, in this story. Well, it's a story that goes back at least to the... Uh time of Lyndon LaRouche, who was a figure uh, on the fringes of the fringe. I mean, he was a character who, uh, he died a few years ago, who was, uh, you know, somehow on the left, somehow on the right, not clear exactly what his politics really added up to, but he had a cult following. And one of his targets was the Frankfurt School, which he blamed along with a number of other demon demonized, uh, you know, sources of all the ills of the world. And uh, a man named Michael Minichino published an article which uh, basically connected uh, them with something called cultural Marxism, which was then uh, the source of all the ills of political correctness. Now, in the, um, uh, I think it must have been the late 90s, um, uh, there was an attempt on, on the part of the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was a right-wing organization uh, associated with um, a number of fairly prominent figures, a man named Weyrich in particular, who was the head of the moral majority, uh, to create a film, uh, an hour-long documentary, pseudo-documentary, in which they were once again accused in this way, the LaRouche way, although they didn't mention his name, of being the source of all the ills of political correctness. And I was asked to do an interview by them, uh, and without realizing what their agenda was, and I'd done lots of interviews on the Frankfurt School, I, I gave uh, you know them, uh, as I normally would, uh, an hour or so answering questions. And it was edited into a long presentation, which went viral and became the source of uh, a very, very widespread, basically conspiracy theory meme, which uh, in written and visual form uh, has had great international resonance. The worst uh, manifestation which uh, occurred after I wrote an article about it uh, in 2010 or 11, uh, in the uh, mass murder uh, uh, in Norway by uh, Anders uh, Breivik, um, where in his manifesto, he cited the Frankfurt School and actually cited, uh, or at least told people to read my book, Dialectical Imagination, to understand the Frankfurt School, cited the Frankfurt School as a source of the evils that he was trying to eradicate by killing scores of people uh, as he did. So it became not simply, uh, let's say, a ideological problem, but a practical problem, one that really had an impact. 
And I wrote a piece in uh, my Salmagundi column. I do a column for the journal Salmagundi twice a year, uh, trying to make sense of it, which also had some impact, but not enough to dissuade people from continuing uh, to uh, repeat it as a kind of meme, that is to say, uh, numbingly uh, repetitive with all the same talking points. And it culminated in ways that showed its impact uh, on Trump himself. And there's a picture that um, I wanted to put in Splinter's Near Eye, but they decided not to use images of William Lind, who is the main, uh, the main figure behind that film that I mentioned before, giving one of his books to Donald Trump in, I think, 2015, before Trump was president. So there's a kind of direct connection between uh, this Frankfurt School demonization uh, and the Trump White House. Not that Trump would actually have read a book, but nonetheless, one can see a kind of affiliation. And so the Frankfurt School still is out there. There are books like uh, The Devil's Pleasure Palace and others by right-wing uh, ideologues uh, and uh, various media people, Ben Shapiro, for example, uh, Andrew Breitbart, who also used the Frankfurt School as a whipping boy. So in a weird way, they uh, became uh, a kind of uh, meme, a uh, vulgarized version of what they had attacked uh, in their analysis of the way in which uh, uh, the pathologization of politics and uh, the uh, what Lowenthal called prophets of deceit uh, were gaining uh, traction in the modern world. And it's one of the great ironies of their history that they could be usable in this rather nasty way. A lot of it, and I'll make a little footnote here and stop, uh, was due to the anti-Semitism that could be mobilized by singling them out as a group of foreign Jews who had come to the United States, uh, and it helped subvert uh, white uh, Christian uh, culture. And this was, you know, sometimes explicit, sometimes implicit in the uh, critique, uh, connects them with figures like Soros, George Soros, and others who are demonized uh, in an anti-Semitic way. So it's uh, very nefarious, uh, and they're, they're part of the uh, this uh, sub-world of um, meme culture on the right, which the internet has certainly abetted. Uh, of course, yeah, that's very disturbing. And um, people often actually underestimate the the power of these kind of memes, uh, thinking of the alt-right and the way in which they they moved the whole kind of debate in America rightwards. Uh, I mean, people could say that, you know, maybe they didn't get Trump elected. It's often said that they got Trump elected, but it's impossible to say really what got Trump elected because the numbers are so narrow. So, you know, he won by a few thousand votes across different states. And uh, I mean, that could really be put down to anything. So, you know, maybe maybe they didn't get Trump elected. Maybe Trump um, isn't on board with the alt-right at all. I mean, I think it seems he played a little bit to their rhetoric through some kind of unusual statements he made in, 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 in speeches, uh, which acted as a kind of dog whistles uh to to them um but i mean i think it's pretty clear he he you know he used the all right more as a smoke screen so people panicked about how far things were going right and then weren't watching what he was really up to um but you know overall the symbolic order was shifted rightwards and the symbolic order is never really just a symbolic order because it affects the kind of things we're talking about and i think it's true as well with the with the Frankfurt School and the way they've been treated mimetically by the right wing. And it makes it quite difficult at points to discuss the Frankfurt School in right circles because, you know, what can be said about them, uh, even jokingly, has has kind of changed. And, and, it, and is that bit more acceptable to just say ridiculous and, and, and racist things um, about them? But, you know, also, it's just great to hear you talk about this as a historian. Uh, so, you know, uh, recounting how this hasn't just come about with figures like Spencer and Breitbart and Ben Shapiro, but actually has come about over a period of time. Um, so that's really important. So, well, one, one of yeah. the, the yeah. ironies, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the, the racket analysis shows that these people don't have principles. Uh, loyalty is personal, it's not theoretical, it's not ideological. So Trump is a figure who emerged out of the swamp, as it were, uh, and we didn't know what he stood for. I mean, there was a kind of 
uh, uncertainty? Was he uh, maybe even going to do things that were progressive? And in weird ways, when you think about it, Trump, uh, for example, uh, in the America First isolationism, uh, helped to undermine uh, the neocon uh, American interventionist uh, ideology, which said that we should always be involved uh, in you know, somehow solving the world's problems through military means, he moved back from that. So in a way, it, it was a kind of weird leftist, or at least, uh, you know, not, not the traditional right-wing position. So we, we weren't clear what his ideology was. And he was able to benefit from uh, piggybacking, we might say, on the hysteria produced by the alt-right uh, media sphere, and now has become a darling of the alt-right uh, and has himself absorbed it, whether or not he believes it. We don't know if Trump is lying to himself or is uh, mentally unstable. Or, I mean, he's really a kind of conundrum. People have almost given up trying to figure out what goes on uh, underneath, uh, you know, the uh, yellow wig or whatever the hell he has on his head. So th there is this kind of um, mystery about what moves him. But what seems most obvious is his desire for uh, power, for fame, for obedience, for admiration, much more than ideological principles. And he would, I think, very easily move in another direction if he thought that it would make him uh, powerful. So in, to that extent, he's less dangerous than someone who really had an ideological position. I think Johnson is like that as well. I mean, Johnson seems less of an ideologue than someone who plays with positions and is somewhat cynical about uh, his ideas. Um, so we'll see how it plays out. Sometimes those people are the worst kinds of opportunists who then, you know, bring uh, into reality a program they didn't themselves believe in, but which nonetheless, you know, is a, a sort of rides them into a power. So we get to asking, I think, at this point, what is to be done next? And of course, we probably won't have any answers. Um, but you know, I think there is uh, a lot of people looking for. Uh, strategies coming from past theorists and Frankfurt School are among the theorists that people appeal to. And I think when people look to the Frankfurt School at this point, and actually perennially really, um, they look to this debate between Marcuse and Adorno in the late 60s when Marcuse was kind of supporting the idea of the great refusal of a protest movement uh, based around the dejected the excluded and uh, and students and the anti-war movement, uh, or what what had come out of the uh, the anti-war movement, and uh, and you know what was kind of you know amalgamating, mixing up with the anti-war movement and becoming a kind of wider uh, kind of request for change. So, um, you know, I think really you have on the one hand Marcuse who says that you know we need a kind of abstract far out art that can break through the the uh, confines of capitalism and we need to kind of mix that up with a uh, protest movement and Adorno says we need an abstract art but it needs to be very much separate it's more of an aid to thinking through new strategies to to developing new ways of of interacting with the object and the other and and we can't really you know develop a protest movement until we've we, we we've first done that. So Adorno famously called the cops on his own students in 1969. Marcuse was telling Adorno he wanted to come over when he next visited Germany and and try and speak to Adorno's students, and that kind of scared Adorno, wondering what Marcuse would would, would say. Um, I mean, today we have a similar thing because we have uh, the very real possibility of huge protest movements post post COVID or as we emerge. From, from from lockdowns for more sustained periods. And as people who were denied the university experience in a normal way meet up with people possibly who who are aggrieved because they've lost work and and also maybe suffered uh you know from COVID or, or seen family members suffer. So you know there's a potential maybe for a mass movement. I talk about this a bit in my next book again the memeing for Mark Fisher. Uh, how the Frankfurt School foresaw capitalist realism, the possibility of a kind of acid communism, as Mark Fisher put it, a, a new countercultural movement. But of course, there is the risk that it would be a, a kind of heinous, terrible right wing movement, as we're seeing in kind of the anti mask movement. So how do you kind of uh, view this? Yeah. I, I mean, th 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 this is, uh, you know, the perennial question of what is to be done or how do you find a link between theory, critical theory and effective critical practice. And 
there's no formula. I mean, I think we can make this symbolic distinction between what Adorno uh, said and uh, did in 1969 and what Marcuse said and did. Uh, we can make it into a symbolic alternative and even opposition. I mean, I think, you know, if you looked at the specifics of that one moment, we might come to, you know, complicated rather than either or, uh, you know, conclusions. But having said that, uh, I think the only answer to that kind of question is situational. So, for example, let me give you two uh, instances. What's happening in Cuba now? So there are mass demonstrations in Cuba uh, on the part of people who are opposed to uh, the regime left by the Castros. Uh, now, they've been seized in the United States by people like Marco Rubio and others who are right wing. Uh, as an example of uh, the way in which the United States needs to create sanctions uh, to bring down the Cuban regime uh, to basically, uh, you know, somehow uh, liberate, uh, uh, finally liberate Cuba. Now, how should we feel about this? I mean, are these protesters uh, complicitous with the restoration of, of what, the Batista regime? Or are they making, uh, you know, real noise against the repressions uh, of uh, Cuban communism? Uh, the same thing in Hong Kong. Uh, what are we to make of the Hong Kong protesters who have now been utterly crushed by uh, the communist Chinese? So mass protest goes in lots of different directions depending on the circumstances. In the United States, the most recent movement uh, that we have to you know, look as an example is, of course, Black Lives Matter. And uh, the great, uh, I think, success of Black Lives Matter during uh, last summer was its... Uh, extension beyond simply uh, people of color to uh, include virtually everybody uh, in the United States who was outraged by police brutality. Now, there's been a backlash against it. Uh, it's been quiet lately, but nonetheless, it had, I think, a great success. We looked 10 years earlier at Occupy as an example. So each of these had their own dynamics. And uh, I'm sure you can give other examples around the world, uh, protest movements, what's happening in Tunisia today example. I mean, who is protesting? What is their, uh, you know, their main uh, objective? Who are they protesting against? And also, what is the uh, potential for a backlash, uh, a counter-revolution, uh, a uh, new authoritarianism? For example, what happened during the Arab Spring? Uh, so there's no, uh, you know, one uh, size fits all answer, whereas Adorno is right, Marcuse is right. Each circumstance is very different. And I think it uh, is crucial for critical intellectuals not to have a knee-jerk relationship to all protests as if they were inherently emancipatory or have what we might associate with Adorno's uh, position, which is the position of, well, not yet. Conditions are not ripe. Uh, we have to wait uh, until somehow there is a systemic crisis and then we act. Because that's a position which leads to a kind of what used to be called uh, attentismus in Germany, a kind of waiting, uh, a kind of quietism, which ultimately uh, serves nobody. So uh, I have no answer to that. And I think, to be honest, we have to be situational, uh, self-critical, uh, and also not think that we have a theory that can be simply applied like a recipe, uh, you know, to creating uh, a tasty meal. It doesn't quite work that way. So we have to be in a way humble as theoreticians, let's say, or as outsiders, humble in the face of protests which have each unique dynamic and can lead to good, but also to bad outcomes. So, yeah, I mean, to a large degree, I agree. I did kind of put out not so much a vision, but an explanation of Mark Fisher's acid communism and how that will work perhaps today. Uh, so basically, Mark Fisher was writing this book, Acid Communism, when he actually took his own life in 2017, and the introduction's available online and, and, and in a compendium of Fisher writings. And basically, Fisher proposes a counterculture for today based on the counterculture of the 60s and 70s, and looks very much to the Frankfurt School. It's great to see him talk about Marcuse and Adorno in that introduction, but of course, we don't know where he would have taken that. Um, but I think, you know, again, seeing a number of disaffected students um, workers or would-be workers um, who will be angered by by uh, by the lockdowns, by the loss of work, by the way that capitalism has uh, certainly you know had a major effect on how 
the, the the coronavirus has been dealt with, you know, we, we can imagine a mass movement emerging, you know, from people suddenly, in, you know, allowed to meet up again and to go on the streets again in, in, in large numbers and, um, you know, wishing to express strong, strong criticisms. Um, I think if you mix that with the capacity of the internet to organize, as we've seen with the Sanders campaign and the Corbyn campaign, actually where you had kind of forums where people were told, go and canvas here, uh, go and do some canvassing here, but also send a couple of memes and phone a friend and talk about politics with them. Um, you know, there were these kind of multifaceted approaches which didn't work really in an electoral sense, or at least didn't get Sanders or Corbyn elected, although they did kind of shift the um, Overton window to the left. Um, but, you know, I think these things, if applied to a counter countercultural movement, have have huge implications. So you could have street protests, you could have um, seminar groups, reading groups, community groups aimed at, you know, speaking to people and talking about, uh, you know, an awareness of social class, spreading class consciousness, as, as, as Fisher puts it. And these could be kind of hand in hand, could go hand in hand with with memes. So I think, you know, there's a potential here we've never seen. I don't know what you make of all of that. You know, building a constituency is the task and it's always the task. And it's always a question of how you do it and how you can do it successfully. And I, I'm not an organizer. I don't know how, you know, in a really nitty gritty way, uh, I can give you any sort of uh, specific advice. I mean, I can make, you know, general noise, but I, I can't. But I, I'm a little nervous about uh, recycling the idea of the great refusal, uh, which is empty. Uh, in a sense, it refuses too much. It refuses stuff that ought to be retained. And if you had to ask where the energy of refusing now is, it's on the right. I mean, the people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th were, uh, you know, examples of a kind of great refusal. They refused the democratic system uh, that had produced an outcome they didn't like. Uh, they refused, um, you know, civil uh, uh, political discourse. Uh, they resorted to violence. They resorted to any means necessary. Uh, and they were deluded. And uh, they were dangerous. And they still have uh, the potential to be even more dangerous in the future. So... Uh, the great refusal as a kind of generic attack on every institution as being inherently corrupt ain't the way to go. Uh, we have to preserve certain things. I mean, I'm, you know, very much uh, sort of supportive of the voters' rights movement in the United States, which is being eroded by uh, Republican attempts to suppress votes. Now, this is, you know, let's say traditional. You have a one person, one vote, formal democracy. You have the idea that democracy produces somehow, uh, you know, people who are honest and who have solutions to problems and, you know, who can work collaboratively. All of that is a bit of, uh, let's say, uh, a pipe dream. And yet, what is the alternative? The alternative is to have some sort of corrupt elite that uh, maintains minority power destroy the possibility of uh, popular decision-making. So, uh, you know, I think the great refusal as a tactic, um, uh, you know, it sounds good, but uh, it's uh, more counterproductive than productive. Uh, and I think we learned during the Trump years uh, how fragile the things that we took for granted really were, a free judiciary, uh, a system of voting that used to be construed as uh, foolproof, um, a media which was understood to be, you know, certainly problematic, but was not the enemy of the people uh, and so forth. So that we have to be aware of both the need to change, but also the need to preserve. And the fact that we have achieved enough that we can't burn it all down. Uh, and, you know, this may be, a, I don't know what, the wisdom of an old man who has seen too many failed attempts at uh, tearing the system down and producing chaos as a result, but that's my kind of neo, I don't know what, I wouldn't say neoliberal, but let's say traditional liberal, uh, non-radical, uh, cautionary Habermasian position that I fall back in, uh, in my uh, twilight years. 
Well, I mean, you can at least fall back on that, <laughs> whereas I can't. As, a, as an Adornian, I can't say I'm an old Look, man. I, 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 have, I have nothing but respect for people who still can muster the, let's say, enthusiasm, energy, and hope to think that more radical activity will be productive rather than counterproductive. I mean, I, I think it can be, and I, I don't want to foreclose anything in advance, but I, I've lived long enough to see how uh, good intentions can go awry. And, you know, the best, uh, uh, I mean, I remember the 60s vividly, and I remember how they sputtered into the 70s and how things really, you know, that we uh, fervently hoped would happen did not happen. Uh, and one hopes that that kind of, let's call it counter-revolution or whatever, um, will not be the norm rather than the exception in the future as well. Okay, I think that's a good place to to end, although we could speak for so much longer, but we have to think right. about the, the viewer, obviously. Um, but aside from that, I just want to ask uh, what you're doing next, because I know you have a, a book coming out soon. You, uh, I have a collection of, of essays called Genesis and Validity that uh, will bring together essays on intellectual history, uh, method, and practice. I'm in the middle of a book uh, on what I call magical nominalism, uh, a little too complicated to explain now, but which ties together work I've been doing in the past 15 or so years on photography, on a certain notion of the idea of the event in history, uh, of Adorno's notion of musical nominalism, which I, I published about. And uh, I'm trying to go against a certain notion of conventional nominalism uh, and try to make sense of what I call its magical alternative, which may have political implications. Uh, I'm not sure yet what they would look like, uh, but that's what's preoccupying me at the moment. Okay, they sound great. I look forward to those books, but also please check out uh, Professor Martin Jay's Splinters in Your Eye, from Verso. It's a great read that addresses a lot of issues very pertinent to today. Okay, so with that, thank you very much for being here. It's been great. I've learned a lot. If you have been enjoying our content, please consider registering your desire with the algorithm by liking and subscribing. This really does help us grow and reach a wider community. If you would like to support our work of documenting and nurturing the rise of post-capitalist desires, become a patron. This allows us to continue research-based memes, podcasts, and videos, as well as up our production value. Patrons receive early views of videos, exclusive content, and more, including physical art, and the ability to directly influence our research topics. The building of a better world happens on many fronts. Turn on, tune in, and shape a future collective reality.